and I'll briefly uh, explain you the learning objectives of this lecture. So I'll be talking about how to identify stakeholders for implementation, how to analyze facilitators and barriers for implementation, and also give you uh, information about how to choose implementation strategies for an implementation plan. I'll be using a few examples of my own research projects for this, so I hope to inspire you and sparkle a little bit of implementation enthusiasm during this lecture. And before we start, I have a few questions for you all, and I post them on menti.com. So you can either scan the QR code or you go to www.menti.com and use the code 73609095. So either scan the QR code or go to menti.com and use the code 73609095. 9095. I'll swap to uh, Menti right now and I see people already found it. So my first question to you is, do you like to cook? It's uh, yeah, like cooking in the kitchen. Do you like to cook? So I see people voting here. There's a majority of people who say yes, so I would like to. I, I do like to cook. Some people say hmm. Not so sure. And for those joining, we're at menti.com. And on the top screen, you can see the code you can enter to join uh, menti.com. So we have about 70% of people who say, yeah, I do like to cook. So I have in total four questions for you. So the second question is, if you cook, do you use a recipe book while cooking? So if you use, uh, do you, uh, if you cook and do you use a recipe or a recipe from the internet or a recipe book while cooking? So we see a bit of a mixture here with people saying, yeah, I do use a recipe book. Some say, mm, not really. Uh, so it's a bit of a mixture, half by half uh, of the people. Oh, now it's exactly perfect, 50-50 or not anymore. I'll move on to my uh, third questions out of four. And because we are asked, do you like to cook? Do you use a recipe book? And the next question would be, if you use a recipe or a recipe book, do you stick to the recipe? Uh, yeah, do you stick to the recipe? And I'm curious to see. So if you use a recipe from a book, from the internet or somewhere, do you then stick exactly to the recipe which is in the recipe book? So I see people here voting and for those joining, we're at menti.com and at the top you can see the code uh, to enter. So we asked, do you like to cook? Do you use a recipe and do you stick to the recipe? And here we see that uh, one third would stick to the recipe book. And then my final question for this moment now is, oh, no, not is. To use a recipe book, do you stick to the recipe book? And in the end, does your prepared meal resemble the picture in the recipe book or in the recipe? That's the final question for now. Does your prepared meal resemble the picture in the recipe book? We see still people voting. So does your prepared meal resemble the picture in the recipe? So I think... We have again one, about one third saying yes and two thirds saying no. And I'll stop the menti now and I'll get back to these questions later on. So first talk about implementation, what to think about. And it's always good to give a little bit of a definition. So what is implementation? And it's defined by uh, Fixen and colleagues as implementation is defined as a specified sector of activities designed to put into practice an activity or program of known dimensions. That's a long <laughs> sentence, but it's actually saying it's putting something into practice. So you develop something, you want to implement something, and you're actually doing it. That's what implementation uh, is about. And there's a whole science behind implementation, and that's what we call implementation science. And there's it's a relative young field, as you can see, it's from 2006, and that's when the Implementation Science Journal was launched. And they have a de definition of implementation science, and I like to highlight a few things in there. So it's about the systematic uptake into routine practice, and it includes the study of, influ of influence of healthcare professionals and organizational behavior. So it's doing something, but keep on doing it in our system. 
and it's about behavior. And I think the last part really stands out to me. So it's about people implementing something and it you want to change their behavior. They used to do it at one way and now we're saying now we have a better intervention, a better guideline, a better protocol or some new IT system and we want you to use it. So people have to change their behavior in order to implement. And I think that's something to keep in mind. Why do we need to think about implementation? And for example, I want to highlight the sequence of injury prevention from my colleague Willem van Mechelen, which was already developed in 1992, saying you need to look at the problem of something, look at the etiology and mechanism, introduce and develop a preventive measure, and then evaluate the effectiveness. How does this work in practice? So we have the sequence of injuries, so we're developing something, evaluating, but then we need to implement this in practice. How does this work? And I like to show that as a fishbowl. So the small bowl can be seen as something you developed uh, or and evaluated, and it's not, it has, obtained, has provided new knowledge. And then the fish needs to jump to the real world. We want to implement it into real world. So people are actually using it in practice. And what we often think when we have developed something that the magic will happen. So we have developed something and then everybody's willing to use our new guideline, our new tool, our new intervention, and that the magic will happen. But the reality is slightly different. And that brings me back to my recipe book. Because I asked you all, do you like to cook? And then 70% said, yes, I do like to cook. When I asked you, do you use a recipe or a recipe book? Half of the people said, yeah, I do use a recipe book. Then people, when we asked, do you stick to the recipe? Only one out of three were left. And does your prepared meal looks like the picture in the recipe book? We had also one third left. And for me, when I try to prepare and cook something, I'm horrible at sticking to recipes. So my food often ends up looking like something like this. But if we translate this to your clinical context, if we ask people to implement something, most people would say, yeah, OK, I'll, I'll give it a try. So that's the 70 percent of you guys willing to cook. If we ask, do you use a recipe book? Then half of the people said, I'm going to use, I use a recipe book. And that's what we see within implementation as well. Of those people who say, yes, I'm willing to implement, not all will stick to our recipe and the recipe of our intervention, the protocol. And then if we ask them, do you use the uh, protocol how it should be? They don't stick to it. So in your case, one out of third said, I would stick to the recipe book here. Uh, in practice, we often see that people don't adhere to protocols of interventions or programs. And in the end, we do expect them to, uh, to result in better return to play, better health outcomes, less injuries. But the problem is we often mainly focus on this part. So we have a patient or an athlete and we, yeah, we, we expose them to an intervention or a program. But in reality, we usually don't expose them to the full program because we don't stick to the program and patients don't stick to the program, resulting in non-optimal uh, outcomes. So we need also to focus on this top level. What's happening there? Why are people not using our intervention or protocols? And why don't they use it as intended? And this is where implementation comes in. We, there, we need to look at all these processes and see how can we improve all these steps in order to promote health outcomes or better return to play in our end users. And if we look at issues in the real world, David Chambers and colleagues had a look at it and they showed at one side the expected effect and on the other side the time. So an intervention that's being developed in an efficacy trial might show really nice results. But then if we move it to an effectiveness trial, a less controlled trial, we often see a drop in the intervention effect. Then if we move to an implementation trial, we often see a stronger drop. And this is what we call in literature a voltage drop. So the amount of expected effect drops often due to the less controlled setting. So people don't stick to our recipe anymore. 
then you would expect the, the results of an implementation trial to sustain over time that people are using it in the way they use it in the implementation trial. But what we often see is that people try to tweak the program a little bit more. For example, it was developed for a specific patient group and then they implement it in other patient groups that were originally part of the research. It could also have a potential positive effect. Sometimes adaptations to a specific context or a specific population or target group are needed to improve effects of an intervention. And this is what we call the program drift. So people are drifting away from the program. So this could be a positive or a negative drift. That's, for example, why Carolyn Finch developed the TRIP model in which they build upon the a sequence of injury prevention, but they extended it with implementation. Well, this is a nice background why it's important, but how to do it? Uh, well, I actually have a simple formula for that. So with the question, are we successful in implementation? Do we have a clinical outcomes? Is a formula of you need to have an effective intervention multiplied by an enabling context and multiplied by an effective implementation method. That means, for example, if you don't have an effective intervention and an intervention could be like a health promotion intervention, sports injury, it could be a, a, a specific surgery, uh, how to do it, or maybe introducing a, a le electronic patient records into an organization. You need to have an effective intervention. You need to make sure that the thing you want to implement is really contributing to it outcomes. Because if we don't have an inter effective intervention or a mismatch with its context, then you might have a perfect intervention, like here something to, for cars to help them go over the uh, fire hose. But if it's on a train track, it probably won't work as intended. So you need to have uh, to find the mismatch between your intervention and your target population or your target users. So I won't go into detail about effective intervention because we're focusing on implementation today. So let's look at why are we not successful if we don't have an enabling context. And you can see it's all multiplied. So if one out of three is not working, then we probably won't have clinical outcomes. So let's have a look at context. And here you can see a picture, some of you might know it. And I, when I look at it, I usually see at first hand a duck. And then if I really make an effort, I can see a rabbit in here. And why do I post this uh, picture here? It's actually showing me that I see something in a specific way or a certain way, but somebody else might have another look at it. So this is why it's important to look at stakeholders and who's engaged in your implementation process. Because they might have a different view and opinion than you might have yourself. So what type of people do we need to think about when we think about stakeholders? So we can think about end users. This could be like a patient you are treating, a sports person, a lead. So the person that the intervention was developed for. Um, but also somebody is putting it into practice, Im is implementing it. And in literature, we often call this an implementer, a user or a provider. So this could be the doctor, coach, maybe a physiotherapist, or in school-based programs, this could be a teacher. But this person is often working in an organization. And within this organization, People like management, colleagues or other uh, disciplines, or for example, if there's an IT system being implemented, your IT department will be a key stakeholder because you need them. And this organization, if we look at the next level, is often organized in the larger social political context. So you can think about a sports federation or maybe a health insurance uh, who needs to cover the cost for an uh, intervention or maybe politics and how they uh, see your intervention fits into the system. And the last stakeholder I would like to highlight is an intervention developer. 
somebody often developed the intervention that could be from a research perspective that they conducted trials and then it's ready to be implemented but it could also be guideline developers or sometimes this can be commercial organizations who have developed something and then want to put it into practice want to implement it so be aware that there are different levels of stakeholders and uh, those stakeholders have different interests and also different power. And it's always good when I start implementing, I just start drawing long lists of all my keys, of all my stakeholders. So who is somewhere in the system is linked to my specific intervention. And you can use the groups that I listed before. And then there, I often end up with a really, really long list. And then I'm saying, Phew, this is a lot and implementation takes time. It's a lot of chatting to people, but well, you can't talk to everyone. So you need to identify who are my key players, who have a lot of strong interest in my intervention, but also who has the power. So if we look at the right top, there are key players. So they have a strong interest in your intervention, but they also have power and importance. So for example, here in this, uh, a corner you could have management of an organization who give mandate for implementing something so you need to have them interested and let them stay there because they are the people with power and can make it happen if you look at the box left from it the meet their needs group those are the people with power but they don't have an interest in your intervention yet so this is a, a target population a, a, a stakeholder group that you really need to focus on because they do have power, for example, a health insurance company, if they have power because they reimburse your uh, health care. But if they don't have an interest, they won't pay for the intervention. So you need to push them to the key player corner. So it's important to talk to, him, to them and uh, explore why they are in their meet their needs group. Then if we look below the key players, there's the keep informed group. So they have uh, a strong interest, but they don't have a strong power or importance. Those are often people uh, we can use in organizations as uh, role models and the people who are very keen of it and can use their enthusiasm to inform others about the intervention and play a key role in that. So those you need to keep them informed, but they will stay hooked on because they like the intervention. If we look at the last square, there's the low priority group. So they don't have an interest, but they don't have any power. So I always talk to a few of those to hear why are you not interested in my intervention or in my guideline or my new my innovation? Uh, because I need to know why they're not interested, but I don't spend too much energy on them. I'm focusing more on the people who have power and the need to be interested in my intervention. An example where we did this uh, is the Eurofit uh, program. Uh, and that was a lifestyle intervention that we developed and implemented in Premier League football clubs in Europe. Uh, and it was using the power of football to attract and motivate male football fans to change their unhealthy lifestyle. So we looked at, okay, we have a lot of men who are overweight and unhealthy but how to attract and seduce them for a healthy lifestyle and joining a lifestyle intervention. And we use the power of football to attract those men, which showed to be really effective in attracting those men to the intervention, but also let them change their lifestyle behaviors. But I was talking about stakeholders. So what, if, what about those stakeholders? So here's a picture that we developed based on the study we did. And I'll start at the right top with the participants. So we have participants of the intervention, the men who were taking part. They are supervised by coaches. So we trained coaches uh, of the clubs to lead the program. Then if we move to the middle, there's a manager of the foundation. So each, the coach was working for a foundation and when it, within this foundation, there was a manager organizing all activities. And this manager and the foundation were linked to the football club. And the football club is not a standalone uh, club. It's linked to specific stakeholders in the community, for example, community health service organizations but also to society, so political, uh, local politics, but also countrywide politicals. Uh, 
And as you can see at the right, there's also university because we developed the intervention and we supported implementation of the intervention and evaluated. So we were also a stakeholder. So be aware that if you're developing something or introducing something within an organization, you have a specific stakeholder role as well. And then there's a question. So I asked you all, uh, uh, do you like to cook? And 70% said, well, I like to cook. But if we ask people, are you willing to implement a new program? So something new. So for example, I ask you all, we have this new uh, evidence-based rehab program. Do you would like to introduce this within your organization? Are you willing to implement this in your organization? And if we ask this to people, there's a number that stands out, and that's 16. So 16% is the people, the amount of people that will easily say, yeah, yeah, that sounds good. I'll give it a try. And uh, this number is based on the work of Roger, Rogers. So this is the diffusion of innovations model. You might know it. But if we look at this end, there's 2.5% that we call the innovators. So those are the people that if you say there's something new, they straight away will say, yes, I'll do it. I always have in mind those are the people when there's a new iPhone, they are queuing up two weeks before in front of the store to make sure they are the first one to have the new iPhone, no matter if it works or not. So that's what we call innovators. They don't need a lot of convincing to, Im to implement something. But they are joined with the early adopters who will easily, after the innovators, will say yes. So together, this group is my 16%. But it means there's 84% still left who will need a little bit more uh, enthusiasm and yeah, information to be convinced. And that's what we call the early majority who will easily say, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll give it a try. But then there's the late majority and the laggards. And the laggards is the group that usually, unless we make it mandatory, won't start implementing your intervention. So be aware that there will always be a group who does not like it. You probably have one of those colleagues who, if something new is introduced uh, within your organization, will say, no, no, I've been doing this for years and the way I do it works perfect, I'm not gonna change. Those will be in the laggard group. So be aware that those people are there and that it's hard to convince them to do uh, to implement your innovation or intervention. So don't spend all your energy on those people, but work with the early adopters and the early majority to convince the late majority. So the 16% brings me to another question uh, uh, to you and I'll switch to the uh, Mentimeter again. So if you think about implementing a new rehab program within your organization, what factors could play a role for you saying, yes, I would do this or no, I wouldn't do this. So if you go back to the menti.com and go back to 73609095, there will be a word cloud appearing. So I'm curious to hear if there is, yeah, what reasons would be there uh, for you to say yes to something new or say, mm, no, I'm not sure to something new. You can answer, uh, yeah, enter anything. And I'm curious to hear why you would say yes or no. Yes, so people are joining in, perfect. So I see evidence, evidence-based magnitude of effect as strong contributors, cost and time are mentioned but also the ease of implementation and is it difficult or not or easy to do? Um, uh, is it attractive? What's the credibility of was there research done? And uh, uh, does it, the practitioner op opinion, does it work for them? And is there an individualized need? So you see there's a lot of factors playing a role when thinking about, am I going to say yes to something new or no to something new. And they could either be, if there is evidence, it could be a facilitator for implementation, but if there's no evidence, it could be a barrier. So there's always two sides of the same coin, often with these factors that play a role. And that's what we call facilitators and barriers for implementation. Well, thank you for your contribution to Menti. I'll go back to my presentation now. 
So there's a lot of factors that play a role, like you mentioned, during implementation. And there's different uh, uh, theoretical models that have organized uh, those factors. But the one I particularly like is the practice guide, which is organized around the socio-ecological model, saying in the middle, the small uh, round is the user characteristic. So this would be your end user, your patient, for example. Then we have the provider level. That's uh, the person, the implementer who is implementing it into practice, which works in an organization, which is embedded in this larger community systems level. And as you can see, there's the same pattern as we saw within the different types of stakeholders. So you will have stakeholders within each of those rows. So if we look at facilitators and barriers, for example, on the implementer level, if the knowledge and beliefs is there, uh, it will help uh, facilitate implementation. But if people don't know what it is, don't know about the evidence, they might are not so keen on implementing something new. If we look at the organizational level, an important factor is organizational support for implementation. Is someone willing to implement, is the organization supporting you and allowing you to spend time on implementing something? So that's an important factor. And often in the larger system, funding plays a role. So, it, for example, is the health insurance company reimbursing the healthcare? There, there's also characteristics on the level of the innovation. So, for example, the complexity, and it was mentioned in the Menti as well, is it easy to use or not? If there's a really complex intervention with multiple components and different activities, it's a bit, a little bit of a big, of a, it's a bigger burden to start implementing something like that instead of it's an easy tick on, tick off uh, activity. But also the process of implementation. So is there a clear planning on how to do this and how are we going to introduce this within our organization and who's taking a lead on what? And finally, of course, you need to think about your end user, the small circle in the uh, larger circles. Are the people you are implementing something for, are they motivated to do this? So do your patients like to work with this or not? And I think it's good to also think about sustainability because I asked, OK, what about if we if, if we have something new to implement in your organization? That's what we call the adoption phase. So people saying, yes, I'm willing to do this. Uh, but there's more phases within implementation. So you have the adoption phase saying, yes, I'm willing to do this or no, potentially. Then the implementation phase where you're actually going to put it into practice. Remember the definition uh, resulting in hopefully a sustainability and sustainability in this context means that it's embedded within practice. So it's routine. Uh, so it's not, oh, we're doing something new, but this is the way how we do it. And it's important to look at facilitators and barriers for each of those dissemination phases, because we often tend to focus a lot on, on getting the adoption ready. So getting people hooked on to our new intervention and we sp spend a lot of time in getting people hook hooked on, inform them. But we expect once they are they've said yes, that they will implement it as intended. But remember the recipe book that people don't tend to stick to the recipe book that we provide them with an intervention on how to do it. So you need to think about facilitators and barriers for implementation and sustainability. Another project I want to highlight uh, for this is the Physicians Implement Exercises Medicine to give you an idea about facilitators and barriers for implementation. So this is building, this project was building on the exercises medicine movement, the worldwide movement, which is focusing on can we re uh, seduce patients to, uh, 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 to go for lifestyle behavior change and lifestyle intervention instead of just providing them with the pill. So that's why we uh, talk uh, to a lot of clinicians to ask why are you not implementing exercises medicine in your clinical practice? Because the evidence is out there, but why are you not prescribing exercise to your patients? And so we looked at the different levels and facilitators and barriers, and I'll highlight a few. So a plus means it's facilitating, but a minus means it's hindering implementation. And as you can see, multiple factors are both facilitating 
and hindering uh, depending on the person. So from a clinician's perspective, knowledge and skills were important. So they needed to know about what is the exercises medicine movement and uh, how does it work for my patients? Uh, do they know and do I have enough knowledge about exercise? Because I might be a completely different clinician in a different field and I don't have the knowledge about what's healthy for exercising. And also lack, lack of task perception. Is it my role as a clinician to talk about someone's health when they are here with me for an eye visit, for example? Or, uh, yeah, do I need to talk about healthy lifestyle then? Because it's not really my task, I believe. That's uh, a barrier for implementation. If we look a little bit at the organization where the people are working, then it was mentioned is if there is within the department a vision and policy, around healthy lifestyle and talking about healthy lifestyle and exercise, then it's easier for clinicians to spend a little bit of time during uh, their consultations with patients to talk about exercise. If we look at the broader context, an important factor which was mainly mentioned as a barrier was the reimbursement by health insurance companies. So for example, if I spend time with my patient talking about exercises, medicine, it takes time away of my healthcare, so I need extra money for that. But on the other hand, if I refer a patient to a lifestyle program, somebody needs to pay for the lifestyle program. So there was a reimbursement uh, problem at multiple levels. But also the patient itself, so uh, as a barrier mentioned by clinicians was also saying, well, I think it's a patient's own responsibility to work on their healthy lifestyle. So it's not my role as a clinician to tell them what to do, but a patient should take their own responsibility to work at their lifestyle. But also some practical considerations. So how much time do you have during a consultation and uh, yeah, some, some it depended on what type of clinicians we spoke to. Some said, yeah, I can easily during my first introduction with um, my first consultation with a patient spend a few minutes on this, while others would say I only have like 10 minutes and I'm not going to use two or three minutes to talk about exercise. So that's, uh, yeah, was a facilitator and barrier at the same time. And the last domain was like the referral options. Clinicians often didn't have any idea where to refer to. So they would potentially refer, if they talked about it, to their local physiotherapist, but otherwise they had no idea. And also uh, outside of the hospital. So it would be referral inside the hospital, but also outside the hospital. So it's very helpful to know all these facilitators and barriers for implementation, because if you talk to the people, then you know what's going on in their mind if they see the rabbit or the duck. And then you can uh, look for strategies to fix these problems. And that brings me to my final box. So let's assume we have an effective intervention and an enabling cost context. If we don't have effective implementation methods, we still do not have clinical outcomes. So that's why it's important to look at implementation strategies. And implementation strategies are methods or techniques used to enhance the adoption, implementation and sustainability of a program. So it's in each dif di dissemination phase of implementation. So this is a complex <laughs> uh, definition, but it's actually the how of implementation. How are we going to do this? Uh, because it won't be implemented by itself, so you need to set up strategies to support the people and convince them in implementing it, but also keep on implementing it on the long term. And Byron Powell and colleagues, they conducted a Delphi study to look at, okay, what implementation strategies are out there? And I'll give you an overview of the types of implementation strategies. So first one, or not the first one, but the first one to highlight would be financial strategies. If you pay people to do something, they are more likely to implement it. And that's, for example, reimbursement by healthcare insurance is a financial strategy. Support for clinicians. If you face a problem while implementing or you have a question, you need to have a uh, a person to go to and ask these questions. And that's also related to interactive assistance. So there needs to be multiple 
levels where you can ask questions, provide support or receive support on how to do this. That's often, for example, on help desk. What we often do is train and educate stakeholders. We tell them this is how you should do it and this is how it should work. Um, and that's also relating to develop stakeholder relationships. So while you're looking at who are my stakeholders and looking at their facilitators and barriers, you're already building up uh, relationships with those people. And what I like uh, by doing those interviews is, is that you plant some seeds for your project. So even if I approach people, I would like to have an interview with you to talk about this potential intervention which we're not going to implement yet but we're looking at the potential then you plant a seed for people to think about hmm interesting this intervention and they provide you with options and suggestions so you hook them on a little bit to your team for implementation uh, so stakeholder relationships are important at those adoption phases but also during implementation and sustainability and you might have slightly different focus on different stakeholders in the different phases Use evaluative strategies. So if you start implementing, it's good to monitor what's going on. And not only monitoring that this for, to, yeah, for data and have nice reports, but I think the strength of this uh, strategy is to feed back this information to the implementing system. Because then you have potential to see, do we need to do it a little bit more like this or a little bit more like that? So it's good to monitor, but then also feedback into the system. Of course, you need to engage your end users like the patients or your athletes uh, during implementation because there might be a, a, a drive from them for implementation. So, for example, with the exercises medicine project, if we have a nationwide campaign about how exercise is important and how your doctor can help you to improve your lifestyle, then uh, patients will ask their doctor, so is there something I could do about my lifestyle, which then helps them to implement the exercises medicine protocols. You sometimes need to change an infrastructure, for example, an IT system. If you're implementing an IT system, it needs a completely different infrastructure and different organization. And lastly, an important one is you need to adapt and tailor to the context. If something works in one space, you might need to tweak and tweak it a little bit so it works in a different context. And that brings me to my last example intervention which was about injury prevention in the Netherlands. Um, and it, it was injury prevention through an app with exercises for each week for warming up exercises. And we did this with the volleyball, football and the hockey um, sports federation. So we involved stakeholders right from the start. So we had multiple interviews with trainers, coaches, but also with the policy and management people to hear what's going on, what are facilitators and barriers for implementation. And then we held group sessions to identify strategies to fix these problems. And we ended up with a multifaceted implementation strategy, which means you put several strategies into place. For example, one was we needed to tailor the app to the target population and change its name. So it shouldn't be a warming up app, but it should be about sport and about health performance. That was a better way of engaging end users. We needed to have a PR and communication plan looking at social media, website, but also integrate this into existing structures. So for example, with the football um, foundation, we integrated into their existing training uh, app. We integrated all the exercises for warming up. We developed an implementation toolkit with a promotion video templates for people to introduce this within their club and a planning on how to do this year, throughout the year. We had a key informant within the sports federation for questions, supports and promotion. And we needed to integrate this into the education program for coaches. So the new future coaches would be aware of the program and how to use it. And that brings me, well, if we tackled all these three boxes, then we can expect clinical outcomes. So we need to focus on the effective intervention, the enabling context and effective implementation methods. And that brings me to my recipe for successful implementation. And I think it's important, and I highlighted this before, to start 
thinking about implementation from day one, if you're starting to develop something, think about how would this fit within our organization, within the system, and how uh, what stakeholders are important for this? Because you need to identify your implementation stakeholders and need to hear what's uh, hindering or facilitating them for implementation, so your barriers and facilitators. Tackle the mismatch between your intervention and implementers. Why would they not be willing to implement this? And also develop an implementation plan with your stakeholders. So make it a co-creation process because you can't think, oh, I think we should do it like this. But there's a lot of stakeholders who might look at it different. So you need to ask them. And I hope this has inspired you to think about implementation, to think about stakeholders, what's uh, hindering or facilitating them, and then look at strategies, how to tackle implementation uh, within your organization. Because I think if we put on our implementation hat every once in a while, we can really contribute to uh, clinical outcomes. Thank you very much.